Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. The word of the Lord. Today we begin a new series on the Gospels, a long series, which we hope to, uh, as is normally our practice, to pursue between Christmas and Easter time. And um, this year we are especially concerned with a prominent theme in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that is the method or the curriculum, the strategy that Jesus Christ used to form the character of his 12 disciples. And uh, we started this series last year between Christmas and Easter and hope to finish the series next year. So this is the middle year of this uh, three-part series on the 12. I wanna thank Phil uh, for his great series uh, as he uh, had us look at the Christ child and um, wonderful that he pointed our attention to the fact that Jesus Christ was born and raised as a disciple. He was born under the discipline of the cross, and now we see that he invited other people into that same curriculum, into the same school, the school of the cross, what we might call cruciform, that is cross-shaped training. And um, in this well-known passage, we want to ask, how did Jesus Christ train his disciples in the school of the cross, cruciform training? And in this passage, the calling of the fishermen to become fishers of men, we see some qualities or elements or features or steps. I hate to use the word steps when it comes to the spiritual life because it seems so mechanical rather than organic. But the truth is, in the life of every disciple of Jesus Christ, both modern and ancient, we do see these stages into which we pass as Jesus Christ calls us into deeper waters. And as we'll see, these steps happen not simply at the outset of the spiritual life, but regularly in the spiritual life. In some sense, the whole worship service is patterned after these steps, as we saw in the calling of Isaiah. We, we come into the holy presence of God, and we see that we are not holy, and the service sort of begins from there. So repeatedly, we're brought through these stages. And whenever the disciples of Jesus, modern and ancient, whenever he calls us into a deeper walk with him, a deeper intimacy or connection with him, we go through something like the process I'm about to isolate and describe from this passage. In other words, there are times in the life of true spirituality that Jesus Christ seems to beckon you or call you or command you or just bring you, whether you want it or not, into deeper water. And I would venture to say that there are people here today in answer to that invitation. In other words, you came to the beginning of the year 
and you set some goals for yourself. Maybe you set physical goals. Maybe you wanted to cut back on your carbohydrate intake this year. Maybe you want to go to the gym more regularly because last year, though you had a subscription for the whole year, you only went once. Maybe uh, you have financial goals, trying to get out of debt this year. Maybe you have some goals for your family, for your, your children. Maybe you have some goals for your relationships, your spouse. Maybe you hope to uh, have some sort of life change this year. And as you're thinking about that, you think, well, why should I only be concerned with this outer part of me? Why should I not be concerned with the inner part, the real me? And as you reflected on that, well, before God, what goals might I have for the real me, for the soul of me, for the spirit of me? Maybe you felt God beckoning you, and maybe you tried to respond to what you believe to be an invitation from Jesus by stepping up your spiritual disciplines. And maybe you said, this year, I'm finally going to do it. I'm going to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, or I'm going to give myself to the practice of prayer, or I'm going to get more involved in the life of the congregation and really enter into the community of this church. Or maybe it really wasn't even an invitation to you. God just brought you there, whether you liked it or not. You found yourself at a new stage in life. Maybe you just got married and you realize, I'm over my head. Maybe, maybe you got a diagnosis from a doctor. And you said, man, I, I can't handle this. I, I have to cry out to God. He brought me to this place where I have a deeper need for him. Maybe you had your first child come along. Maybe there was a dramatic change in your employment. Maybe a promotion. Maybe it went the other way. Maybe you find yourself unemployed, but you feel over your head at this moment. Maybe you graduated from a graduate program and you're entering into a career. Maybe retirement and you don't really know what to do with your time. I've heard retired people say, I have so much to do, I don't know how I ever found time to work. But maybe you don't really know how to invest that time. You find yourself in deep water. And I felt like it might be a help to our congregation. If we could see, even though we're all different and we all have different stories and we all have come to believe in Jesus Christ, those who do believe, in different ways. But I do believe that there are a, there's a story here in the lives, not only of these fishermen, but in the number of a countless number of people in the Bible. For instance, Isaiah, disciples ancient and modern. When God calls you or brings you into a deeper place, and there's a pattern that goes like this. Number one, there's an apparently unreasonable request or directive from God. Secondly, Somehow, surprisingly, you find yourself agreeing to this absurd directive from God, and there's a willingness in yourself. Third, once you launch out in the calling, there's a kind of two-part traumatic encounter that you undergo. And then lastly, there's a gift of assurance and promise from God in the midst of that calling. Now, let me say them again, just in case you want to follow an outline. An apparent unreasonable directive or request from God. It meets with a surprising willingness in yourself, which is followed by a two-part traumatic encounter and then a sense of assurance and promise from God. These components or steps into a deeper walk correspond to the four quotations that I've highlighted in the bulletin today. And the first, an apparently unreasonable request or directive from God is summarized in the words of Jesus Christ to Simon Peter. Launch out into the deep water, let down your nets for a catch. And the parallel uh, in your life, in our lives as modern disciples, because we're not like Peter, one of the 12 apostles, but the life parallel of all the disciples is that anyone who connects to or goes deeper with Jesus Christ and hears the calling, that calling sounds counterintuitive and even absurd. For Peter, it would have been very unusual, for instance, to take fishing advice from a construction worker. That's basically what carpenters were in the ancient world. And fishing wasn't just a hobby for Peter. 
you know, where he looked around at other anglers and said, hey, where are, they, where are they biting today? It wasn't like that for him. For Peter, fishing wasn't a hobby. Fishing was a living. Multi-generational vocation for him and his family and his cousins. Jesus, on the other hand, was from Nazareth. Nazareth was 20 miles away from the water. And all around this Lake Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, there were fishing villages full of fishing experts who could offer advice. And all the advice had Peter looked for advice would have been the same. What? You fished all night and didn't catch anything? Go get a meal, get a shower, go to sleep, and try it again tomorrow night. Because the last thing you ever want to do is drop down linen nets, which are visible to the fish by day, during the day. Even a carpenter knows not to do that. And then add to the fact, add, this, add to this fact that, that the disciples and fishermen were tired, really sleepy, worn out after fruitlessly throwing their nets in and out of the water all night. They want to sleep, they want to eat. And add to that the fact that they had just cleaned the nets. Why would we clean the nets and get them immediately dirty when we know we're not going to catch anything? And knowing all of this, the rabbi, the teacher says to them anyway, put out into the deeper water and lower your nets for a catch. I think immediately Peter thought, well, I know what this is. It's a test kind of a cruel test, kind of sounds like Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, you remember? Cruel, most irrational and absurd thing that you can imagine. Now, um, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea here. It's not like Jesus Christ just met Peter for the first time. And I think some people imagine Jesus came up and has this kind of uh, hypnotic eye thing going on and he says, Peter, follow me. And then Peter gets up and says, I will follow. It's that Peter had known Jesus. In fact, in the last episode before this, we find Jesus Christ in the home of Peter and he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And there had been apparently other encounters so that Peter knew him and was able to respond to him as master and Lord. And he admires this rabbi, but with all due respect, what does a construction worker and a religious teacher know about fishing? I mean, Lord, if it's okay with you, I'll leave the spiritual stuff to you. You leave the fishing to me. And there's every indicator to Peter that this is a bad idea. But you know, by the way, you know where Peter was from? Atlanta, Georgia. No. <laughs> Peter was from a town in Galilee called Bethsaida, which means house of fish. You don't want to give fishing advice to a guy from the house of fish. And so the fisherman mildly objects to the rabbi. Well, we fished all night and didn't catch anything. And I'm sure the other fisher, fishermen around him were snickering and giggling and laughing at Peter even having to explain this. Now let me suggest that every person who hears the gospel the basic message of Christianity, the doing and dying and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation and the reclamation of the world, the basic message of Christianity. When you first hear it and it dawns on you what this might mean for your life, something about it always seems like a really, really bad idea. And it strikes you at some point <coughs> as unreasonable and ill-advised, just like it did for Peter. And so it is with every subsequent step along the Christian walk. For some, when they first begin to consider Christianity, it seems to them too easy. And there's always a kind of person who says, wait a minute, is this a message of a free grace, free gift from God? I'm not that kind of person. I've had to work hard for everything I've ever gotten in this world. And I think if you tell people that their past, present, and future sins are forgiven by what some rabbi did on a hill far away, you're just encouraging spiritual slackness. Not for me. I want a respectable religion that you have to work for. 
And for others, it seems too difficult. Someone might say, how could you possibly believe that a man foretold his own death and resurrection and then actually rose from the dead? How can scientific modern people believe that? Another person will say, well, why should I get involved in this thing with the Christians when the Christians can't even agree among themselves? It's Pentecostals and Presbyterians. There's Baptists and brethren. There's Lutherans and Episcopalians. There's Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants. They can't even agree among themselves. And then finally, someone might say, well, did you know that the sexual ethic in Christianity is hopelessly regressive? I could never live by that kind of an ethic. The point is, no matter what your culture, no matter when you were born, no matter what your upbringing or your worldview, there will always be something in the gospel, usually a number of things, that strike you as going radically against the grain of your culture and of common sense, that it's unreasonable and ill-advised. And it may be that at present, you see yourself as someone who admires Jesus. You might even call him like Peter did, master and Lord. You might even think of yourself as a Christian. But somewhere along the line, you've been reading the Bible more, you've been listening to sermons more, you've gotten into a Bible study with other people and you're starting to rethink this thing. You're sensing a kind of call to launch out into a deeper place, into deeper water and to do something that you really believe this great teacher wants you to do. It's becoming clear to you that he's inviting you, he's beckoning you, he, he's alluring you, he's calling you, or just plain bringing you into some deeper step. Again, it may be a forgiveness issue. You might have been a Christian for many years and suddenly you keep thinking about a person from your former life that you've really never, con never forgiven. The truth is you want ill to befall that person. And now you're thinking about it. This is a deeper step for me to be able to forgive that kind of a person. Maybe it's an illness, as I mentioned. Maybe you just got a diagnosis and said, I can't do this. I'm going into deep water. I'm going to need God like I never needed him before. Maybe it's a new stage in life. You just had uh, a marriage. You just had a divorce. You just had a child. You just entered upon a career or retirement. It may be that this year you feel like God is calling you in, in response to some sermon you heard or some part of the Bible that you've read. It may be that you feel like God is calling you into some deeper involvement with poor people. You see that over and over again in the Bible. It might be a more disciplined course of giving charitably. You know, we all start the Christian life generous. We give whenever we feel moved. But maybe it's dawning on you. Hey, the church has to pay its electric bill whether it feels moved or not. And so maybe I should give in a more disciplined way, which would be a good thing. It could be some tangible demonstration of love. You're seeing that scripture. Nothing matters but faith expressing itself by love. And you're thinking, I'd like to get into that place. I'd like to volunteer with Mary Porter. Mary Porter has been roaming around hunting for scalps to help her in children's ministry. And if she comes for you, I warn you, she'll get you. And maybe you're sensing, maybe I should answer that call. Or maybe Norm Box has been on the warpath for you. Come help us with our English as a second language ministry. And you're thinking, I really feel like God is calling me to do that, but I just don't have the time. Maybe you feel called to a small group or a class. Maybe you're thinking through, maybe I should unite with these people. Actually be a member of this church, faith expressing itself by love. Or maybe you are feeling the call to come out of the closet. As a Christian, I mean. You know, because Christians have to come out of the closet today. We have to let people know around us. Yeah, you know, I'm actually one of them. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And maybe that's struck fear into you as you thought about telling your family and friends about that. And just as Peter had voices, had these specialists and professional fishermen all around him saying, oh no, he is not going to listen to a carpenter, is he? And so in the same way, voices are saying the same thing to you, ridiculing you, reinforcing the apparent absurdity of the call of Jesus Christ on your life. So that's it. 
The gospel and the calling of Jesus Christ strikes us as it did Simon Peter, as strange. Like too good to be true, counterintuitive, absurd in this modern era to be a Christian. And if it's never struck you that way, if you've never seen how the gospel goes totally against the grain of your life, you've probably never really understood the gospel or considered it very deeply. Second, somehow this unreasonable and apparently absurd call that is coming from God, somehow it meets in you a kind of surprising willingness. And you're saying to yourself, this is absurd. Who would ever do that? I'll do it. And here's the quote. Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but we will do as you say and let down the nets. And for some inexplicable reason, in opposition to your own inner voice and to the voices of the specialists and family and friends around you, you find yourself saying, but I will do as you've called me to do. And despite Peter's intellectual objections, because he knew about fishing on the Galilee, you don't fish in the daytime. And despite his fears of being ridiculed by other fishermen and by society, and despite his own body's extreme weariness, somehow in Peter, a deeper motivation prevails, and Peter finds himself saying, I will let down the nets. And of course, the name that we give to that deeper motivation is trust. Because somehow, in Peter's soul, He's crossed the line. And he's begun to have a greater confidence in this amazing person, more confidence in Jesus Christ than he has in those other voices, even more confidence in Jesus than he has in his own inner voice. And maybe Peter is saying, as he complies with his apparently ridiculous order, I can't believe I'm doing this. But at some deeper level, another voice is speaking within Peter and is telling him, Peter, only trust him. No man ever spoke like he speaks. He has the words of eternal life. Everything, Peter, that you have ever yearned for is found in him. And he is the hero of the entire human story. Only trust him. And out of that deeper place, maybe it's a small place, maybe it's a very weak place, maybe it's only the size of a mustard seed. But in simple trust, Peter says, Master, I will. And that's really what faith looks like. It doesn't feel good. I've had people say to me before, Oh, I'm sure your faith must really comfort you. And I think to myself, actually, faith makes me really uncomfortable. I'd rather see things than believe them. And faith often doesn't feel like certainty. It doesn't feel like proof. A lot of times, faith doesn't even seem like a good decision. You come to trust that he knows and he sees more than you do. It feels like you're twisting in the wind. It feels like you're bucking the system. It feels like you're working without knowing, without certainty. You can't see it. And I want to see it. No, I want to make my decisions based on what I can see. But faith is the evidence of things not seen. Somehow, you find yourself saying, He is real, He is true. He is trustworthy. And you find yourself, despite objections from others, and despite your own doubts, you find yourself saying, Lord, I trust you more, and I will do as you say. Third, the story reaches its climax when after the miraculous haul of fish, Simon Peter has, by faith, an experiential contact with this amazing person who commands the fish and upholds all things by the word of his power. And Simon Peter has a realization. He has an epiphany. By the way, today is Epiphany 
in the Eastern Orthodox calendar. And Peter has an epiphany and with it, a two-part traumatic realization. He sees Jesus for who he is and then immediately he sees himself for who he is. First, a deeper view of Jesus and then Peter's own traumatic self-discovery. Like Isaiah. Isaiah sees the holiness of God and what does he say? Woe is me. I'm lost. I'm ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and God has just called me to use these unclean lips to be his spokesman, to be a prophet. These lips are not fit to be a spokesman for God. And both Peter and Isaiah and countless other number of disciples, both in the Bible and since that time, get a new view of God and then immediately they get a new view of themselves. Peter recognizes that this person is not just a carpenter or a rabbi, but that this is a supernatural person and a holy being. And then he realizes that he, Peter, is in way over his head. And he is ill-equipped to stand in the company of this person and to answer his call. And Peter feels sinful. And he expresses it. Lord, go away from me. Can you imagine saying that to Jesus Christ? Lord, go away from me. I am a sinful man. Leave me alone. In other words, Peter is saying, I don't know who you think I am, but you got the wrong guy. It's not that Peter has low self-esteem. It's not that he is psychologically maladjusted. Later on, as we read the Gospels, we'll find that Peter's self-esteem is quite intact. As he says, even if all these boneheads reject you, I will never leave you. Like he's the best of all the disciples. He has a pretty high self-esteem. But that Peter now, for the first time, he's no longer comparing himself to other people, to shades of gray, to relative forms of righteousness. But now Peter is standing in the presence of and comparing himself to purity himself. And suddenly everything else goes dim and a light is illuminating and exposing everything, including Peter himself. And Peter feels in the presence of holiness, naked and ashamed. And as in the life of every Christian, there's this sense that I am sinful and guilty. And yet this holy and glorious being has taken an interest in me. He's coming after me. He wants to engage me. And now I see that life can never be the same. And for Peter, and I think for every Christian, it strikes a kind of fear into us. Just like Isaiah says, woe is me. Just like John the Revelator. As he sees Jesus Christ risen from the dead, he falls at his feet as a dead man and Jesus has to assure him. In all these cases, it's a person getting a real glimpse of God and then a real glimpse of himself. John Calvin, in his magnum opus, his great work, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, starts off the whole thing by pointing to this very truth in these words. It is evident that a person never comes to a true self-knowledge until he has previously contemplated the face of God and come down after such contemplation to look into himself. And that's why Peter says, I've seen God, and now for the first time I'm really seeing myself. And I can say to Jesus Christ, Lord, you got the wrong man. And yet, as we read the Gospels, especially this section of Luke, you'll see it. These are just the kind of people Jesus Christ is looking for. People aware of their own guilt, of their shortcomings. People like you and me. Real sinners. And when Peter or Isaiah or John, when they see what purity looks like and they see themselves, they are overcome with fear. And then they hear the most welcoming voice you could ever hear. It's the last of our quotes. Jesus Christ says to the sinful and petrified Petros, do not fear. From now on, you'll be catching men. A gift of promise and assurance from God. Jesus Christ is saying, what you feel right now, 
the complete incompatibility between your sinfulness and my purity, the total incongruity between fallen men and holy God. That reason, that gap, that's unbridgeable, is why I have come into the world. I am the Lamb of God to bridge that gap, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do not fear. It's as if Jesus Christ looks at Peter and says, Oh, Peter, you didn't think that this calling was dependent on your willpower, did you? It's not dependent on your power. It's all dependent on my promise. I told the first service that I wasn't going to say this because it might embarrass her, but just a word about my proposal to Missy. I know despite what most people believe, I actually asked her to marry me, not the other way around. But when I asked Missy to marry me at the ripe age of 22, what was I thinking? <laughs> we were in the backyard of my parents' house, and um, I put a huge rock on her finger. Since that time, it's gotten much smaller, but it was, it was once just like a size of an iceberg. And uh, we sat there in that moment of bliss, you know, and, and then uh, Missy went inside to show my sisters the ring. She said, come on, let's go show them. I said, if it's all right with you, I'll just sit out here for a second. I found myself like Abraham, looking up at the stars. It was pitch black night. And I thought to myself, Lord, what have I done? <laughs> Not because I thought she was the wrong girl. Never thought that. But just because I thought to myself, Lord, I cannot even take responsibility for my own life. And now I have to take responsibility for someone else's life? I can't do that. And I felt, I believe, the assurance and the promise of God, just like it was experienced by Peter. You didn't think, TJ, that this marriage was dependent on your willpower, did you? It's not dependent on your power. It's dependent on my promise. And so Jesus says quickly, as the father said to the prodigal son, here, here's a token of my love, a signet ring and a robe of your belonging. I've come to live for you and to die for you. I've come to include you in my father's work. I'll make you genuinely, Peter, genuinely concerned for people. And you will, not by your power, but by my promise. You will bring them into the kingdom, filling churches with people as you once filled boats with fish. I'll give you the inner frame of mind to gather into the church the lost sons and daughters of God and to congregate them in the house of joy. My spirit will equip you for this calling. You know, Luke uses a kind of pun. It's a compound word in the Greek language. You will be live-catching people. That's what he says. It's as if he says to Peter, you used to catch live fish and make them dead. Now you're going to catch dead men and make them alive. And Peter is still, by his words, under the power of the Holy Spirit, still catching people and bringing them into the church. You ever notice how the church looks like an upside-down boat? You ever see this church? Did you know the name in church architecture for the place where you're sitting? It's not the sanctuary. In church architecture, it's called the nave, like navy or navigate. It's a nautical term. And Peter, even to this day, is filling boats full of human beings. And this, Jesus Christ says to everyone with the tiniest bit of faith, see my majesty, see my mission, see my person, Recognize your sinfulness and your inability and trust that I have come to pay the price. Don't send me away. I've come for people like you. Leave the past, the present, the future to me and join me in the great harvest of the new creation. I've come to give you life and purpose and mission. Come on, come deeper with me. As absurd as it seems, as traumatic as it will be, and I will give you my assurance and my promise. Do not fear. Now here's the last thing I want to say in this closing paragraph. What about you? 
What about you? At the beginning of this new decade, 2020, where do you see yourself in this story? Are you still offering objections? Are you still waiting for all your questions to be answered before you launch out deeper with Jesus Christ? Because I can tell you, that will never come in this life. As we close in prayer, why don't you try to see yourself at some point on this journey and respond to this amazing person who calls you into the deep. Don't fear, don't trust in your own willpower, but trust in his promise and his assurance. Go deeper, only trust him. Let's pray together. Father, we ask now that you would give us courage and a courage not based on our level of commitment, but a courage based on the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. Help us to trust him who pours out the spirit without measure and enables sinful and unabled people to rise up and to answer a call that is frankly beyond us. We ask with the Apostle Paul, who is adequate for these things? And we praise you with him to say, thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, bless us now as we worship on our way out and use us in the world to glorify yourself. And if there is some person here standing on the seashore, unwilling to launch out deeper, we ask that by your spirit you would equip them with trust to believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.